the main theme of today's lecture is conditional PDFs, okay? So this is something that we talked about uh, pre-exam one was conditional probability. So, um, whoops, I got my camera messed up here. What happened? Okay, so conditional PDFs. So remember that one of the first equations we talked about in the class was this conditional probability equation. The probability of A given B was the probability of A and B over probability of B, right? Or probability of A uh, intersect B over probability of B, same thing. So we had this kind of idea that if I had the sample space and I had two events, A and B, and I told you that uh, B happened, and then I know what's the pro I don't want to know what's the probability that A happened, right? And so the kind of the idea was that I would take the fraction of stuff in the overlap region and think about it as kind of a ratio of um, that over the whole thing, right? So in this case, I drew this as probability of A given B. That's like saying I tell you that um, I tell you that B happened, right? And now I want to know what's the probability that A happened. And so there are some events where A and B both happened and some events where just B happened by itself and the conditional probability is basically the ratio of those two areas, right? And so at the time we were just talking about this basically in the context of uh, events and I guess we did talk about this a little bit in terms of, I think we talked about conditional probability mass functions, right? So something along the lines of saying, you know, I flip the coin and I say what's the probability distribution given that at least two heads occurred, what's the conditional PMF, right? We talked about that a little bit already. Uh, and so now we can kind of revisit this idea in the context of PDFs and joint random variables. So now we've learned a little bit more and we want to know how we can apply this conditional probability idea. And so there are lots and lots of applications of this concept to real world decision making. So um, the stuff we're going to talk about kind of post exam two is getting a little bit more into the beginnings of, you know, like what might be lecture one in a class like pattern recognition or machine learning or, um, you know, there's a class called, um, well, I guess pattern recognition is a, good, is a good example. There's a class called detection and estimation. These are kind of like, you know, 4,000, 6,000 level classes and what you're seeing post exam two is kind of like some of the introduction to stuff that you might see there, okay? So, for example, you know, some applications are things like, um, you know, if I have X is the input to a communications channel and Y is the output of the channel, I want to know something like, you know, what is the best estimate of X given that we saw Y? And so the definition of, of best is going to vary in a couple of different ways as we're going to see in this lecture and in some other lectures, right? So for example, I've got some sort of a, a noisy communication channel that's noising up the stuff that I put into it and I want to know, you know, how can I denoise the output to get the best estimate of the input, right? So one example might be some sort of like a, you know, a communication systems where letters are coming across the channel, right? And I want to know, okay, well, uh, you know, I received uh, C, B, U, right? And that's not an English word, and I want to say, okay, well, you know, if these letters were flipped by, like, one letter, maybe a likely outcome would be C-A-T instead of C-B-U. And so there's questions about, like, how do I decide, you know, given how things might have been flipped or noised up, how do I figure out what the correct input might have been, right? So that kind of comes up all the time in communications theory. Or you might ask something like, um, you know, in a more kind of continuous sense, you might say, or like N is the number of arrivals in uh, some interval, and T is the service time it takes for every arrival, and that might, know, might want to know something like, you know, what is the probability that there are uh, no customers arrive while a given customer is serviced, right? 
So this might have an application in terms of, you know, how many tellers do I need at my bank, or how many uh, TSA people do I need at a security checkpoint, or how many, you know, how much uh, capacity does my router need to have for all the internet traffic that's going on in my school, right? So that's kind of the basic idea. Um, and so we did talk about conditional probability mass functions already. So let me just revisit uh, what we talked about before. So kind of um, remember, uh, we had basically like conditional PMS. This is like the discrete case, right? So we define something like, you know, what is the probability of Y given X of an outcome yj given that an outcome xk occurred. And we didn't, we didn't actually talk about it quite like this at the time, but I think now you can understand this in terms of joint variables and uh, random variables instead of events. So this is kind of like saying, okay, you know, the probability of y given x, thinking about that as a PMF, is like I take the joint and I normalize the joint by the marginal. So kind of a key thing for today in general is that the conditional PMF is equal to the joint PMF over the marginal PMF. And so let me just do a simple example of this, okay, to kind of refresh your memory about how this works. So remember that we did an example where, um, let's say we you know, toss a coin three times, and X is the number of heads, and Y is the position of the first head, and we're gonna say that position is zero if there are no heads at all. And so, we can make a table of what are the outcomes and what are X and Y, right? So um, let me just do that. We have outcome, then we have X, and we have Y. Actually, it would make more sense to do outcome, why did I do it this way? Outcome, X, and Y, right? So let me just list the eight outcomes that we could have. Right, so X is the number of heads, and I can make my table of X pretty easily. And Y is the number, or is the position of the first head, so here Y is one, and here Y is one, here Y is two, here Y is one, two, three, zero. Okay? And so now I can think about, you know, talking about the joint PMF, right? The joint PMF, which I guess we didn't talk about when we were talking about PMFs, but now you kind of know what we can do with it, is I could say, okay, um, the joint PMF is, if I make uh, X on this side and Y on that side, here are the three possibilities for X, here are the three possibilities for Y, and I think about, okay, well, how often do these things occur, right? There's basically like a one-eighth probability of each of these outcomes, so zero, zero has probability one-eighth, and basically uh, everything has a probability one-eighth except for uh, two, one, which could happen in two different ways. So two comma one has probability of a fourth, but all the other things that I can see here occur with probability one-eighth, uh, like this, right? Let's make sure I add up. I got four, five, six-eighths plus two-eighths is, is the total, right? So this is my joint PMF, and then I can also think about what is my, um, you know, PMF in X, right? So my uh, PMF in X, or actually, first let's do the PMF in Y. The PMF in Y is easier to see like this, because how do I get the um, marginal in Y, I just add down the columns and say, I don't care what X is, just tell me what the overall probability of getting a certain value of Y. 
So if I were to sum down the columns, I would have basically, again, four possibilities for y. The probability of getting zero would be one eighth. The probability of getting one would be one fourth plus another fourth is a half. Then I'd have a quarter and I'd have an eighth, right? So that's just like summing down the columns. And if I wanted to know what was the marginal in x, I would get that by adding up across the rows, right? So if I add up this way, there is a probability of one eighth getting zero, three eighths getting one, sorry, uh, three eighths getting two, and one eighths getting three. And if you remember, we kind of noticed that this looks like kind of like a binomial distribution, or this is a binomial distribution, and this looks kind of like a geometric distribution where it's truncated, where I put all the rest of the mass over here at zero. So this, this example, I feel like we did um, earlier, okay? But now we can think about, okay, so, um, well, first of all, we can ask, is are x and y independent, right? So if x and y are independent, I should be able to get the joint PMF from multiplying the two marginal PMFs. And I can see that's definitely not true, right? So for example, here, you know, the probability of x being one and y being zero, if I multiply these two numbers together, I get three over 64, but I can see that x being one and y being zero is zero, right? It's impossible. So definitely these two random variables are not independent. Um, the new twist is, okay, what are the conditional probabilities, right? So what would be, for example, um, the probability of y given x. And again, the way to think about this is that I give you a value of x, and then you tell me what is then the conditional distribution of y, okay? So we're gonna look at something that's like uh, p of y given x of some value of y given some value of x. And this is what we get by taking the joint and dividing by the marginal. Let me stop and ask for a second. Questions so far? Okay, so now I want to say, okay, suppose I tell you that x was equal to zero, right? What would be the conditional PMF, right? So if I look at the probability of y given x of y given zero, right? Well, that's like saying, okay, I'm only looking at this row of the table now, and I want to renormalize this row to sum to one, right? So here, uh, there's only one possibility for y. If x is equal to zero, it's that y is equal to zero, right? So my new conditional PMF looks like uh, this, right? So if I tell you uh, that x is equal to zero, suddenly I get a much simpler PMF, right? This is like saying that, you know, there's only one possibility, right? I get zero. If I were to ask about the probability of y given x if x is equal to one, then I would have a table that looks like my possible values of y, and now I'm just looking at the one row of the table, right, like this. So I normalize this by the sum of the elements of the row. I, and actually, a different way to think about this is that I normalize it by the marginal, right? So it's like saying, consider the case when x is equal to one, here is my marginal value, three eighths. So I take my PDF along this, or I take my uh, joint PMF along this row, and I divide by this marginal to kind of normalize things. And that's like saying now I have a one third probability of each of these things happening. So a conditional PMF is always a valid distribution, right? It always sums to one. So you're just basically thinking about rebalancing things so that they sum to one. And kind of conversely, if I wanted to say, okay, you know, what's the probability, like the conditional probability of uh, x given y, so I'm sorry I'm gonna have to move this paper because I wanna keep this joint on the, on the board here. I could say, um, you know, similarly, you know, the probability of x given y is like uh, normalizing a 
column. So if I ask you for what is the probability of X given Y, and maybe I tell you now Y is equal to one, right? Then I will have, again, my list of possible X values, and those could be zero, one, two, or three, and I normalize now by just the sum of this column, which in the marginal I can see the sum of those numbers is one half, right? So I divide one eighth by one half, and I get uh, one quarter. And I divide a quarter by a half, and I get a half, and I get a quarter. And so just to write down what I said before, conditional, you know, PMFs are just a, another type of PMF, meaning that uh, they sum to one, right? They are a valid PMF. So let me stop and ask any questions about this. All right, so now let's take it over into the continuous world, right? So, of course, you know that sums are gonna turn into integrals, right? Uh, so let's do kind of some terminology there. So, um, in the continuous world, let's just, uh, so for continuous random variables, um, same deal, right? So I have a PDF, Y given X, of getting Y given, you know, that X is some value, right? So it's like saying, again, I fix, you know, I mean, don't, don't get too confused. I, the, the notation is the same, right? So I just don't, kind of trying to make it very explicit to say, it's like I tell you, okay, X was five. Now I want you to know, I want you to tell me what is the PDF of Y. So one way to think about this is that, again, if X and Y are not independent, you know, I had basically the marginal of Y before, which is just like what is Y doing on its own. Now I tell you some information. I tell you, hey, X was equal to this thing. It changes the PDF of Y from what it was before to this new thing, right? If things are not independent, telling me some value about X gives me some new information and it changes the shape of the PDF, right? And the definition is exactly the same, right? That's like saying that I have the conditional PDF is equal to the joint PDF divided by the marginal. Let me just write that down again. Conditional equals joint over marginal. So this is just like generalizing the same thing that we just did for discrete random variables. So just to make it really clear, a couple things fall out of this, right? So consequently, if I just rearrange this formula, a different way of saying this is that the joint PDF is equal to the conditional PDF times this marginal. Or I could rearrange things in the other way and say like this. That is to say that the joint is equal to the conditional times the marginal. And as we're going to see in, you know, some examples, this is often very useful because sometimes what you want is the joint and you don't have, you know, uh, you, you have these two things but you want to compute the other one, right? Or, as I'm going to show you in a second, you know, a common kind of problem is that I know one of the marginals and I know one of the conditionals and I want to compute the other marginal. And so we'll, we'll do an example like that. Another kind of little consequence is that, um, you know, if X and Y are independent, then that means that um, the joint decouples 
into the product of the marginals, right? And from what I said earlier, for example, that's like saying that um, this is a different way of writing the joint. These things cancel, and so the implication is that the conditional of y given x is the same as the marginal of y, right? And what that means is that, you know, if I tell you that x happened, it doesn't have any bearing on the distribution of y. It's like saying that I tell you that x happened, I get the same PDF that I had for y in the first place, right? So there's no new information that comes from knowing about y. And that's the intuition behind independence in the first place, right? That these two things don't give you any information about each other. Okay, so comments or questions about this? All right, so let me do an example. This is like the, the classic kind of uh, conditional probability example here. So let's suppose that I uh, select X uniformly on the interval zero to one, and then I select Y uniformly on the interval zero to X, whatever I chose. And now I want to know, uh, find the PDF of Y. Okay. So what have I told you, right? I've kind of told you the marginal in X, right? And I've told you the conditional for Y given X, right? So let me be a little more precise about that. So what we know is that the PDF of X is equal to basically uniform distribution on zero to one. And the PDF of Y given X, so if I tell you what X is, then I have a uniform distribution between zero and X, and the height of this thing has to be one over X to make sure that the area of this box is still one, right? To make sure this is a valid PDF. And so what is my path to solving this problem going to be? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply this formula and say, well, I know this and I know that. And so I can multiply those two things together to get the joint random variable. And then if I wanted to, I could get the marginal in Y by taking this thing and uh, basically integrating out X, right? So let's, go, let's do that. So basically step one is to compute the joint PDF. So that would be, oops, sorry. That would be uh, the product of these things. So the joint PDF is gonna be the conditional times the marginal both of which we know, and that's going to equal, well, what's the product of these things? It's going to be equal to 1 over x, and what are the valid ranges of uh, x and y? So we know that x could be between 0 and 1, and we know that y could be between 0 and x. So it's kind of like saying that I have this kind of like triangle of possibilities, right? So on the x-axis, I have this. And on the y-axis, I have this, and here's my line, x equals y. So this is like saying that if I pick x, then what are the possibility values of y? They're between 0 and x. So it's kind of like saying that my PDF is equal to 1 over x in this poorly shaded region. And now I could say, OK, what's the uh, PDF of y, right? So the PDF of y is what I'm going to get by integrating the joint and saying, I don't care what x is, right? That's like saying, I'm going to go along my uh, possible values of y, and I'm going to integrate up all of the probability mass going in these horizontal line directions, right? So that integral is going to basically look like um, 
well, if I pick a value of y, what does x range between? So x is going to range between whatever y was and 1. And then the number that I put into the integral is 1 over x, and that's going to be dx. And the integral of 1 over x is log of x. Right. Evaluated at x equals 1 and x equals y. So what I get is log of 1 minus log of y. Log of 1 is equal to 0. So I just get minus log of y. And y is in the range 0 to 1. So if I were to plot that, basically the PDF would look something like um, something like this. Actually, there's an asymptote at 0, and it stops like this. So what this tells me is that small values of y are much more likely than big values of y. And that kind of makes sense, because if I think back to how I did this, you know, uh, y can always be close to 0, but it's going to be very difficult for me to get a value of y that's close to 1, because that means I would have had to pick a big x and then again, coincidentally, pick a big y that was towards the end of that interval. So it definitely makes sense that smaller values of uh, y are more likely. So smaller values of y are more likely the big ones. So questions about this example, the idea of it or the mechanics of it? Okay, so this is kind of like your typical, oh. y is the integral from x equals y to x equals 1. That comes from this picture, right? So it's like saying that if I fix the value of x, what does, uh, did I do this wrong? Oh, I'm sorry. So I fix the value of y. I want to know what's the PDF of y at this point. So if I fix the value of y, what does x range between, right? This is the line x equals y, right? And this is the line x equals 1. So again, again, as with all these kind of integration things, sometimes you have to draw the picture and think about what is the right limits of integration. Other questions? OK. So um, one thing I want to say without proving it is that um, in the interest of not doing truly messy math. So um, just kind of a note, and we can read more about this. So here, um, let's say if x and y are jointly Gaussian, let's say that they have zero mean to make life easier. And um, let's say that they also have unit variance. And then they have uh, the correlation coefficient. Rho. So just kind of remember, what does that mean? That means that, you know, x and y are Gaussian, but they're also correlated. So let me just say that the correlation efficient row, I'm going to assume it's not necessarily equal to 0, right? So that means that if I were to think about that Gaussian hill that I get, if I were to plot the PDF, it would look something like, uh, you know, it would look something like this, right, where these are kind of like slicing the, uh, you know, slicing the hill from top to bottom, like a topographic map, right? So um, kind of the question is, you know, I know that, I think we talked about this earlier, that if I were to look for the marginal in x or the marginal in y, that's like pushing that hill down. And we showed that both of those marginal distributions were also Gaussian, right? Question. You just thought it was like a bullseye of some sort? OK, so this is like x, this is like y, and this is kind of like uh, iso probability contours, right? 
I know that's a real help. So let me, let me try to draw this picture a little bit uh, better. So uh, that's like saying that if I have my X and Y, and this picture here is the joint Gaussian PDF, then that basically is gonna look like some sort of a two-dimensional mountain, and what these red circles are are red to represent are the you know, things I get by chopping that mountain like this. Yeah, you like that? I should've done that the first time? Okay, it's a nice picture. Okay, so um, other comments? Okay, so we already kind of know that, um, you know, before we showed that um, the, the marginals are uh, also Gaussian. And certainly, you know, the marginals have zero mean also, right? So if I were to push this guy down, then the center of this distribution, because it's kind of like half of it's on this side, half of it's on this side, clearly the mean is still gonna be zero if I push it down onto the x-axis or the y-axis, right? Um, so they're also Gaussian and zero mean. Um, but it turns out that you can show that, um, you know, what would I need to do if I wanted to figure out the joint, right? Or the, I'm sorry, the conditional. The conditional would be like saying, okay, uh, I would have to take the joint PDF and divide it by the marginal in X, right? And I could do that, and it would be tedious. I'm just gonna give you what the result is in this example. Um, So if I were to do this messy joint Gaussian PDF and divide it by his other PDF and cancel out all the stuff, this is what I would get, right? And I'm, I'm saving you my, you know, complicated uh, derivation of this, right? Um, what I would get is, this is actually, again, a Gaussian. So this is basically a Gaussian with uh, mean, well, the mean is gonna be uh, rho x, right? because this is like what plays the role of mu, and the uh, standard deviation, the sigma, is gonna be played by this thing, one minus rho squared. And so what this is saying, just as a side note, is that if I tell you what x is, and then I ask you what is the conditional PDF, it's not, the same as the marginal, right? And the reason for that is that the, the row is not necessarily equal to zero, right? If these two random variables are correlated, then telling me something about x will change my density in y. So it's kind of like saying, okay, suppose I told you that x was this value here, right? I told you that x was right here, and now I think about, okay, well, here are my possible values of y, and clearly, now things are gonna be a little bit offset, right? So, um, you know, there's gonna be more probability that things are happening above the x-axis than below the x-axis. So if I were to think about, you know, this is like the line, uh, it's like a square here. That's like kind of saying that, you know, the marginal is gonna look like, um, this is tricky to draw, you know, something like this. So when I, when I redraw the marginal in y, it's like saying it's no longer centered at the middle, it's centered at y equals rho times x, it's centered at a different place. So actually, yes, it's not centered exactly at x, this is like x, this is like rho x. All I'm trying to say here, and don't, don't get too hung up on it, is that, you know, the conditional PDF is offset towards x if the variables are correlated, or, or are, well, I guess, 
correlated is the same as not being independent in this case, right? So depending on how correlated they are, you know, I could be very different than the marginal, right? Because I know the marginal is always going to be zero mean, but here if I tell you, okay, x was 50 and the correlation was, you know, one half, then the mean of the conditional PDF is going to be 25 and not zero. So again, that kind of comes from the fact that, you know, when things are correlated, you get, or when things are not independent, you get these kinds of relationships, right? And again, remember that for Gaussians, independent and uncorrelated are the same thing, so that's why I'm being a little bit loose with which one I mean. All right, so let me pause and ask questions about this. This is more of an algebra exercise that is a, um, you know, it's, it's just kind of like another application of, of what would it mean to look at the conditional for real values of, of PDFs. Would, this would be too complicated to ask you to do on an exam because of how tedious it would be. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something similar on the homework where, you know, again, it's kind of just like the problem I gave you with uniform random variables, except it's going to be with exponential random variables. And so you have to do kind of like this, you know, compute the joint, divide by the marginal to get the conditional, just to kind of get you used to working back and forth between these things. Okay. So let me then go to some stuff that's a little bit more uh, real worldy. Okay. And so this is, again, kind of the beginnings of, well, we're going to talk about things like hypothesis detection or hypothesis um, testing, right? Um, which I think is, is kind of cool stuff and definitely stuff that is uh, not just like textbook material, but, you know, real world stuff. And so let me give you the kind of uh, classic pattern recognition. This is like the pattern recognition book by uh, authors named Duda and Hart that I learned from when I was in grad school back in the day. I don't know if they still use it, but this was like page one of that textbook was an example about uh, distinguishing between two different kinds of fish, okay? And so I always remember this example because it's got salmon and tuna. So uh, here's the example, classic Duda and Hart example, which is basically saying, supposing that you didn't know anything about a fish, but um, Let's say I observe the length of a fish as it comes down my conveyor belt or whatever, and let's call that uh, x, okay? And now what I want to do is I want to decide, is this fish a tuna or a salmon, okay? And suppose that I've, you know, been able to obtain the conditional PDFs of X given these uh, possibilities, right? So, for example, you know, I have one PDF that says this is the uh, PDF of uh, X given salmon. And then I've got another PDF that is X, I guess, X given tuna. Okay, and now I see a fish, and I want to know which one is it more likely to be, right? Which fish is it? And so there are a couple ways of, of thinking about how to solve this problem, okay? Uh, and so the best, well, no, okay, I shouldn't say best. A, a good way to think about this problem is in a Bayesian framework, okay? So we're going to go back to Bayes' rule and say, okay, you know, well, if I'm going to make the decision about salmon and tuna, I also kind of need to know what is the proportion in the population of salmon and tuna, right? So, I mean, uh, it could be that if there were five times as many salmon as tuna in my river, then I should kind of have that prior probability that salmon is five times more likely, right? And then seeing this new bit of information, the length, is going to kind of rebalance my understanding or my estimation of whether it's one or the other, okay? So, a Bayesian approach, would be to say, okay, the probability, for example, of salmon given x is going to be um, the probability of x given salmon times the probability of salmon over 
the probability of x, right? Why is that, right? This is, again, just a reframing of the way that conditional and joint probabilities work. So if I go back to my, um, you know, if I go back to my examples, this is one of the first things we said is that, you know, I can take the joint and I can either write it like one conditional times one marginal or the other conditional times the other marginal. And that's exactly what I've done here. I've basically said, you know, salmon given x times p of x is the same as x given salmon times p of salmon, right? So it's just a way of rewriting what is the, what is the joint, right? And so these, um, if I'm going to write this a little bit more like in terms of probabilities, this is kind of like the conditional probability of a continuous number given one of these classes, right? This is like a number, and here I've got like more like a discrete random variable, either salmon or tuna, right? So here, x is continuous, but salmon or tuna is discrete. And then, you know, there are kind of, you know, what is the overall probability of a given length? I can use my kind of total probability theorem to say this is like there are two possibilities, salmon or uh, tuna. So here the denominator I'm getting from what we originally called the total probability theorem. And so my um, decision rule, basically, what I'm saying is that here, before we started, I had a prior probability of thinking that this was salmon, right? Based on, for example, the population of salmon and tuna in my lake. I guess probably salmon and tuna are not found in the same places, but this is a you know, toy example, right? This here is called the likelihood. This is like saying, okay, these are the class conditional probabilities where if I tell you a certain class, then I know this picture of what should the PDF be like, right? And this guy here is called the posterior. And so the idea is that what I want to do is find this posterior probability, right? I, I had a prior probability that didn't have anything to do with what I observed, then I saw some data, and now I want to upgrade my prior probability to a posterior probability, and I want to choose the fish that has the higher posterior probability, right? That, that's what the Bayesian logic would tell us. And so that leads us to kind of this Bayesian decision rule, right? So um, this leads to what's called the Bayes decision rule. which says that I should decide salmon if the posterior probability of salmon given my observation is bigger than the posterior probability of tuna given my observation. And vice versa, right? I decide tuna otherwise. And if both these things are equal, then it doesn't really matter how I break the tie. And so why is this good? So this basically, um, this rule minimizes the probability of making an error. What is, you know, how could I go wrong, right? So how could I go wrong is that you know, so, so it turns out, let me just um, rearrange things a little bit, right? So uh, let me rearrange my, my rule here. This is like saying that, um, you know, the probability of salmon greater than x, this is my rule for choosing salmon, right? 
That's like saying, okay, my fx of x given salmon times the probability of salmon over the probability of x being greater than this conditional probability. And so here you can see that I don't actually have to um, compute this denominator, right? So here I was kind of making a note that I could compute the bottom of this if I wanted to, but usually I just care about whether the numerator is bigger than the other numerator. So I don't actually have to usually compute this part and say that, you know, don't usually have to compute. And then what I have is basically a rule that says uh, I choose salmon if the PDF like this, I look, I'm basically looking at the ratio of these two conditional PDFs. And all I'm doing is re rearranging this top equation. And this is sometimes called a likelihood ratio test, because what I'm doing is I'm looking at the ratio between these two likelihoods, these two conditional PDFs. And if the proportion of these two things is equal, right, so um, if the probability of tuna is the same as probability of salmon, which would have to be one half for each, then that's just like saying I choose whichever PDF is bigger at uh, x, right? So it's like saying that, you know, suppose both these things were equal, what would this rule mean? It would be basically like saying, okay, here I saw this value, and then I would look at the value here and the value here, and I would just choose whichever one was bigger, right? That's what's called, uh, that would be what's called a maximum likelihood estimate. Meaning that, you know, I don't really have, so kind of an equivalent way I think about this is that, you know, I am agnostic, I have no real prior information, and so I'm just going to choose whichever one has got a bigger likelihood, right? And what you can kind of see here in this example is that, you know, in, this, in the way that I drew these pictures, I mean, these are kind of like semi-Gaussian, but not necessarily. You know, here, there's kind of like this crossover point, right? So let me redraw this picture so I'm not drawing all over the original image. So kind of what this reduces to is that I have a, um, you know, here's my PDF of x given salmon. Here's my PDF of, oops, x given tuna. Sorry for this glitch there. And so kind of what happens is that somewhere there is a crossover point, right? So suppose that these things are both equal to a half. That would be like saying that here there is a line. And um, this is kind of like the special point where below this line, I choose salmon, and above this line, I choose tuna. And how could I make a mistake, right? So it's certainly possible that I could have a particularly big salmon, and that would mean that I would make the wrong choice. Or I could have a particularly small tuna, and I would also make a wrong choice. So kind of the places where things could go wrong would be like here for tuna and here for salmon. So I can think about, you know, the probability of error would be equal to the probability that, um, so basically it would be like saying, um, what's the best way to say this? The probability that x is greater than this target value given, uh, I guess that salmon is the one like here, weighted by the probability that salmon is happening in the first place, or I could have the probability that x is less than the target value, given tuna, times the probability of getting tuna in the first place. 
Now, if these two priors were not equal, then the crossover point might not be exactly where I drew it. It could be somewhere else, right? So for example, if tuna was much, much more common than salmon, then probably what would happen would be that this line would move off to the left so that I would be much more likely to choose tuna all the time because my prior probability would influence my decision. So I stop and ask questions about this example. So on the homework, there is a nice example of doing this where the two PDFs are Gaussian, right? And so you can work out, okay, you know, what is the crossover point uh, given the priors, and what is the point at which I decide above this point is one decision, above this, below that point is the other decision, right? And what is the error? And so this kind of formalism is very common in, um, is it showing it? To Dr. Dr. Tell, well, that's good. So we won't know until we, we actually leave class. Okay. So, questions or comments about this? So let me kind of revisit this idea. So basically, the one, one thing I want you to take away from today is that there are two kind of key ways of doing this kind of uh, estimation or decision, right? There's a Bayesian way and there's a maxim likelihood way, okay? So uh, kind of a key takeaway. is that there are you know, two uh, important ways of making decisions or estimating parameters or living your life. Right, one is kind of a uh, Bayesian way and the other is the maximum likelihood way. And the thing that distinguishes these, similar to the example that we just did, is that in the Bayesian world, we have a decision that depends on prior probabilities, right? So the Bayesian world, you know, depends on priors. And, you know, it also depends on data. You know, I see some data, and I see some priors, and I make a decision, right? The maximum likelihood one basically kind of only depends on the data. It doesn't depend on any sort of priors. So let me do a couple more examples kind of in this maximum likelihood world, okay? And then think about how we would turn that into a Bayesian thing. So it's certainly usually easier to do maximum likelihood stuff, meaning that I don't have to worry about any sort of prior probabilities on anything, right? Um, so let's start talking about what's called um, maximum likelihood estimation. And honestly, we're going to come back to this after Thanksgiving and so on. But this is kind of an important idea is, you know, a lot of times, you know, what are kind of like estimation problems, right? Estimation problems means that I have something about my PDF that I don't know, right? Say I don't know its mean or I don't know its variance, right? And now I see a bunch of examples and I want to use these to estimate my unknown parameters of my distribution, right? So this kind of comes up a lot in terms of like fitting distributions to data, right? Um, how do I know what the right PDF is for my data? I see a lot of examples and I try to fit a PDF, PDF to it, which means I'm trying to figure out what are the right parameters for my PDF. For an exponential, it could be the lambda parameter, right? How do I know what that is? And so, actually, I think that's the homework that I'm giving you on, uh, on today, so I don't want to solve that problem right now. But the idea is that, you know, um, suppose we observe samples from a continuous PDF, right? That is, what we see is, you know, x1, x2, xn, that we hypothesize are generated by an underlying PDF, 
with some unknown parameters. And let's call those parameters theta, okay? And so maximum likelihood basically is saying, you know, uh, we want to find these parameters, theta, to maximize this conditional probability, the probability of seeing this set of data given theta. So just to do a, an easy example, or an easy-ish example, um, let's suppose that I am trying to figure out what is the uh, mean of this Gaussian, okay? So I know the underlying PDF is Gaussian, and let's suppose I also know what the variance is, and all I'm trying to estimate is what is the mean, okay? So, for example, suppose we know um, the PDF is Gaussian, and we know it's sigma, but we don't know this mu. So what we have is a conditional PDF, right? So we have a conditional PDF that says, um, so I guess in my notes and, and in what I'm going to write, you know, you'll see me toggling back and forth between F and P. And at this point, it's not really that important, right? So for example, you know, um, when I was doing this example before, you know, this thing like kind of mixed up P's and F's, you know, it doesn't really matter that much as long as we're clear on what's a PDF and what's uh, uh, just a number probability. So, you know, the PDF, uh, of seeing a given sample, assuming that mu was the right mean, what would that be? Well, I know sigma, and my conditional PDF would be um, this. Right, this is just the Gaussian PDF and I show you a sample xk, and then I uh, hypothesize that the mean is mu, okay? And let's suppose that I draw a whole bunch of samples, right? So I could be drawing 10, 20 samples, and this is just a PDF of one of those samples. Now, typically in these applications, you assume that the samples that you're drawing are also all independent of each other. That is, drawing one value does not have any impact on what the drawing the next value is. Otherwise, life would be really complicated, right? So if all the samples are independent, um, and this is a good uh, word to know, IID. This means uh, independently and identically distributed. So sometimes you may see that in a book or a paper, IID, that just means that, you know, you're not going crazy and all the samples are just like independent of each other and they're all coming from the same underlying distribution. So then, you know, what I have here is that the joint probability, whoops, sorry, the joint probability of observing all these samples given this hypothesis about the mean, so here, this is like the joint PDF. And now you see that, you know, after exam two, we're pulling up our trousers, right? This is gonna be like, you know, n things. It's like a n dimensional joint probability, right? So, uh, but luckily, since everything's independent, that means that we can pull those probabilities apart to say that, you know, the probability of observing this thing, hypo our hypothesis is that this stuff is all independent, right? So it's like saying that I have the probability of uh, x1 given this thing of just this value. Uh, and then I have the next marginal. And so on. 
dot, dot, dot. So the idea is that I can pull out all these things, and these things are all basically the same PDF, right? So this is basically like saying, you know, I have the product from i equals 1 to n of the same PDF, 1 over square root 2 pi, sigma, e to the minus xi minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared. Right, so this is basically like the joint distribution of all my xi's. And now in a maximum likelihood estimation problem, I would say, okay, everything here is, is fixed and known except for mu, right? I know the sigma, I've seen all the xi's, now I want to find out what is the best mu, right? What is the thing that maximizes this function? Well, then I would take the derivative and set it equal to zero, right? Which, which could be a real mess. So luckily, you know, so to find the uh, mu that maximizes this uh, probability, probability, um, we would basically take the derivative d d mu of this mess and set it equal to zero, right? Now, this is again a little bit of a math trick, but the idea is to say that, you know, well, okay, I could, I could do that, but um, one thing to observe is that if I have this, uh, let's just take a look, for example, at y and log y. What does that look like? Well, if y is increasing, log y is also increasing. So basically, this is like a transformation from one thing to the other. If, if y is maximum, then log y will also be maximum. So, um, you know, since log y increases monotonically, meaning doesn't decrease with y, um, the theta that maximizes y will also maximize log y, which means that I can take the log of this thing and life will be much easier. So what is the log of this junk here? So let, let me stop and ask for a question for a second. Questions about what I'm, what I'm doing? I'm giving you a problem like this on the homework, but the problem on the homework is much easier than this because there's not so much complicated math. But the, the process is the same. You look at the joint PDF, and you take the derivative with respect to the parameter, and you set it equal to zero, right? In this case, since taking the derivative is a little bit messy, I'm finding a little bit of a back door into making my life a little bit easier. So instead of maximizing this thing, I'm going to take the log of this and maximize it. So what is the log of it? And sometimes, again, you'll see in papers and books the log likelihood. So the log of this here, well, remember that the log of a product is the sum of the logs, right? Again, this is kind of like a, an old log AB is log A plus log B, right? So um, here, this log of this thing turns into the sum from i equals 1 to n. The log of uh, this thing, which is just a constant, uh, plus the log of this thing, which is 1 over 2 sigma squared xi minus mu squared, like this. This is going to be much easier to take the derivative of, right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the derivative of this thing. Derivative of this part is just 0, because this is a constant. Derivative of this part is going to be uh, the sum from i equals 1 to n of 1 over 2 sigma squared. There's going to be a negative here. What's the derivative of this? It's going to be 2 xi minus mu times negative 1, because I'm taking the derivative with respect to mu. And I'm saying that equal to 0. So what I'm going to get is 1 over 2 sigma squared times this sum. Uh, I guess that this 2 can cancel with this 2. xi minus mu 
equals zero. Um, sigma squared now doesn't matter. So all I'm saying is that, you know, I have the sum of the xi's. I can take the mu out minus uh, n times mu equals zero. And so that means that the mu that I choose should equal to be one over n times the sum of the xi's. And this is just basically the average of the x's. So, um, in hindsight, this all kind of hopefully makes some sense, which says that, you know, I estimate the mean as the average of the data, right? And that, that kind of stands to reason, right? So I show you a bunch of data and I ask you what is the, uh, you know, what's your estimate of the mean of this distribution? You would just take the mean of what you saw and that would be the natural way to do it, right? This is just the mathematical derivation of making that work, okay? So questions about this. Again, focus more on the process than on the math. The process is I form the joint distribution, I take the derivative with respect to the parameter I care about, I set it equals zero, I solve for that parameter, right? And usually the answer that you get will make some sort of sense, right? So I think that you're gonna find it on the homework, it's a similar deal where I'm asking you to find out what is the uh, maximum likelihood estimate of the parameter of an exponential distribution and when you come up with your answer, you should be able to look back on that and say, oh yeah, I can kind of see why that is the right answer, given what I know about the exponential distribution. So you have to take a look at that on the homework. So last thing I want to say, and I'm not sure if I'm going to solve this all the way through, is that, you know, this is purely based on the data that I'm seeing, right? The data and the knowledge about what the form of the PDF is. Now, what would a Bayesian person do, right? A Bayesian person would say, well, that's, that's great, but what if I also had some extra information about what I thought mu was in the first place, right? So say, you know, Bob down the street told me that, hey, by the way, mu is probably between two and five, right? So now I've got some extra information that is going to bias my estimate of, of the parameter that takes into account both the data and the prior. And so I'm not going to work through this in gory detail, but for example, you know, uh, the Bayesian parameter estimation approach would be kind of similar to this, except uh, we would also say we also have a prior distribution on the parameter, right? We'd have some PDF, P of theta, okay? And then a Bayesian person would say that, okay, you shouldn't just be choosing the thing that gave you the maximum likelihood, you should be taking that prior into account. And so the Bayesian would say, uh, well, what you should be doing is maximizing the probability of theta given all your data, which would be equal to taking the conditional probability of the data given the parameter times the probability of the parameter over this probability here, right? So again, this would be like saying, you know, before I told you what P of theta, you know, was as a prior probability, now I see this data and I look at the likelihood and then I kind of combine those two things to get my posterior and that's what I optimize, right? So basically, you know, the idea is here, if I maximize this, what I have is maximum likelihood. And if I maximize this, what I would have would be Bayesian. And so we're going to kind of revisit these ideas um, after Thanksgiving because, you know, there are a bunch of different ways to think about parameter estimation. But this is kind of like, you know, the beginnings of if you want to take pattern recognition or intuitive machine learning or deep learning, right? You know, like all these kinds of things are important to kind of understand 
the relationships between conditional, marginal, joint, all that stuff, right? So um, hopefully that gives you a good introduction to that kind of thing. So questions or comments?